Thank you, Maya and Hala. Thank you, thank, thank you, Karim. Thank, thank you, Dr. Eva. Right. It's my pleasure now to uh, to present and to chair the um, European chapter's presentation. I will start with a very interesting topic, which is the rehabilitation houses for eating disorders in Israel by um, Professor Yael Ladzer. She is a doctor of medical science, graduated from Technion Medical School in Haifa, Israel, certified psychotherapist, family therapist, and uh, had a two-year fellowship on eating disorders at Menninger Foundation in the USA. She is a full professor and former dean of School of Social Work, University of Haifa, published more than 200 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, and edited four books on eating disorders. She is the founder and director of the Eating Disorders Institution in Rambam Medical Center, Haifa, since 25 years. And she is the president of the Israeli Association for Eating Disorders and vice president of the European chapter of Eating Disorders. She developed an innovative uh, rehabilitation house for women with severe eating disorders. And she was awarded by the, the Academy for Eating Disorders for her international contribution to the field of eating disorders. Thank you so much for being with us today. And Professor Ladzer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karim. Let me upload my presentation. Okay, before starting, I would like uh, to express, first of all, uh, my gratitude and thanks for my friend, my friends and my friends and colleague Umberto for organizing this amazing uh, pre-conference uh, for Eva, for Karin, for Montessera, and of course, uh, to Alicia and Dawn, without them, we are nothing. And uh, it's a really, really pleasure to be here and to present uh, my work. So do you see the presentation or no? So, no. No. So I will have to do it all the again. Okay now? Yes, now we see it. Okay, okay. So let me see that I can move it on. So I will start with the story of Ella. A 20, oh, I don't know what's happened because. Now it's okay. Ella is a 28-year-old female diagnosed with anorexia nervosa binge purge type, referred to for the seventh time in a severe condition to the eating disorder inpatient unit in Tel Aviv, Israel. Her first hospitalization was at age 15. After each hospitalization, she received an intensive outpatient treatment, yet, she was unable to maintain her weight and the improved eating behavior achieved during each, was, uh, uh, each admission, uh, she failed to keep it. So during the current admission caused by life-threatening condition, she expressed her fear of her being discharged. She openly expressed fear of her inability to effectively cope with stressful situation in real life out of the hospital. So Ella case is similar to many other individuals suffering with severe chronic eating disorder. The question clinician and researcher are, are trying to answer is what kind of follow-up care should be provided in order to prevent relapse, and what kind of coping strategies and interpersonal skill do this patient need in order to cope with the challenges in their life? 
So the failure to maintain the clinical gain achieved during acute treatment is unfortunately a very common phenomenon in the course of eating disorder and in particular in anorexia nervosa. Relapse rate of eating disorder are reported to range from 33% to 63%. So the greater risk of relapse occurred during the first year following discharge from initial treatment, commonly followed by a revolving door syndrome of repeated inpatient admission. So therefore, the need for new theoretical and treatment strategy is urgent, especially for severe eating disorder. Only few studies provided evidence-based treatment for patients with chronic eating disorder. For adults with chronic eating disorder, in particular anorexia, no specific treatment has been shown to be superior. Furthermore, Many treatments have failed to address the core symptoms and life coping skills in the rehabilitation phase. Therefore, British and United States guidelines did not provide any specific recommendation for the treatment of severe and anorexia, severe and chronic anorexia in adults. Given these difficulties and challenges, we established a novel rehabilitation treatment program in Israel for patients with severe eating disorder. Our unique rehabilitation house program aims to provide a long-term rehabilitation treatment in supportive home-like environment outside the medical center. What was the theoretical background be, be, uh, based uh, on our program? So the project was based on the recovery theory in mental health adapted for patients with eating disorder. Psychiatric rehabilitation involves two main goals, a clinical recovery and personal recovery. Clinical recovery emphasized on the absence of active symptoms of the illness, while personal recovery strives towards the individual ability to live a full life while coping and living with partial illness. So the rehabilitation goal now moved from the clinical part to the personal part in most countries. Not full recovery, yet live and cope with the illness in a better adjustment to a normal life. The goals of this model include strengthening patient autonomy and coping strategies to improve quality of life, to have better sense of well being to achieve greater fulfillment of their needs and goal in major aspect of life. So this was mental health and the innovative project of mental health in the community all over the world. So we established a law in accordance with this theoretical and treatment process. So considering these changes, the new law was passed in Israel in 2001, the law for rehabilitation and mentally handicapped. Within this law, a basket of rehabilitation services was provided for free to this population, including employment, housing, schooling, vocational treated, training, development of social and leisure time, et cetera, et cetera. However, despite the success of the new law, until 15 years ago, individuals with eating disorder 
were not included in this privilege that includes the law. And what is the situation in Israel? As we heard from other uh, lecturer, the prevalence of eating disorder in Israel is likely to be similar to other Western countries. The revolving door syndrome of repetitive hospitalization, ineffective treatment trials, and poor prognosis was apparent also in Israel among those with chronic eating disorder. So in order to stop the revolving door, inspired by strategies used in the psychiatric rehabilitation, we come up with the idea to create a unique rehabilitation house for eating disorder. Our goal was to reintegrate these patients into the community. So what was the process of receiving government and authority approval? You know, from all the countries, it's difficult to pass this obstacle. So public debate and advocacy arouse, demanding legislation change to include patients with severe eating disorder into the mental health law and provide them with the rehabilitation basket rights. As a first step, we submitted the proposed model to the Department of Special Projects of the National Social Security in Israel. This department usually support project that was not supported by the government. And if they find out to be successful, then the government take over. The model was adapted to meet the needs for patients with severe eating disorder. After an in-depth evaluation, the project was approved by a national social security. Thereafter, approved by a Ministry of Health and Social Welfare, who promised to take over after three years of pilot. The National Social Security provided the main funding for the pilot period for three years, meaning three million Israel shekels, it's about $800,000. The program we developed, entitled Sedala Derech, which means food for the road, was first proposed in 2006, established in 2008, and opened in July 2009, and trans transferred to the Ministry of Health and Welfare responsibility in 2012. Of course, we opened with the opening ceremony. This is all the important people who came to the ceremony. The second step was to achieve, was achieved after a three years experiential period when the program was found to be successful. The third step project was to start to be funded by the Ministry of Health and partially by the Ministry of Welfare. So this is a representative of Ministry of Health that came uh, to see the house. And this is a representative of Ministry of Welfare. He is now the president of Israel. Finally, patients with eating disorder included in the mental health law and received a full rehabilitation package. And this is the major contribution of this process. The package include housing, education, professional training, social and leisure activity and treatment uh, coordinating. All patients supported by the government with about $3,000 per, per person per month. So let me describe the model for the transitional rehabilitation housing that I developed. So first, we had to construct the house according to the Ministry of Health standard. So we have we has to find the house and to reconstruct it accordingly. Then we have to construct the rooms according to the Ministry of Health standard, which has to be 
a standard of a room, two beds, etc., with the furniture according to the, the standard. And then we had to furnish the whole house. So this is the living room. This is a TV area. This is also a TV area, another rest area. This is part of the living room. Very nice design. This is the dining room and the kitchen that provide place to 16, a resident. This is the working area, the rest area. This is a staff office and meeting room. This is in real time. In the outdoor terrace. So let's describe the house, the aim and the objective to provide, as I said, a long-term intervention in a home-like, non-clinical and non-institutional environment, to improve nutrition and eating behavior, to integrate with others in the community, to have a meaningful activities and balanced lifestyle, to connect with the family, to have a self-awareness, self-esteem to strengthen and to strengthen autonomy. The aim, to maintain a target weight of a minimum BMI 19, express motivation and commitment to participate in the rehabilitation recovery process and to follow all the rules. The participant is young adult, men and women, age 18 to 35 year old, that completed an inpatient treatment for eating disorder or are being treated in an outpatient center in a very severe eating disorder condition and in a semi-recovery phase, but lacked the coping skill to function effectively in their day-to-day -day lives and in the community. The time limit is up to a year and a half. After completing the program, they moved to live in their own nearby the rehabilitation house and supervised by a social work and dietitian for an additional year, once a week. The house and its facility never closed, including Shabbat and high holidays. Shabbat is the weekend. The personal staff is a house director, rehabilitation social work, house mother, dietitian, supervisor, counselors, residents receive medical and psychotherapy and psychiatric follow-up in the community outside the house. And this is one of the basic principles of this house as opposed to some other residential houses that are connected to the hospital or to the eating disorder center. What was the activities in the, in the meeting of this house? All housing activity are mandatory and all residents are expected to, to participate. The house management group led by the house director focused on issues related to day-to-day -day life in the house like conflict, new requests or ideas, issue related to guests and more. Another group is interpersonal group led by the house social worker focused on improving communication skills, developing adaptive coping strategies. The balanced eating group was led by a house dietitian to achieve healthy eating behavior and nutrition. And an evaluation at a follow-up meeting is four times a year. It happens individually, not with all the residents led by the director house, accompanied by social work dietitian, home mother, and the resident primary counselors. The rehabilitation meeting is weekly, individual meeting with social work. And then they have another weekly individual meeting with the dietitian. 
the housing structure and policy. Food eating policy, the home mother is in charge of all the food arrangement. Six meals are provided. The large kitchen and dining area is open all day for use by the residents. Kitchen and food rules apply to residents, guests, and staff. The policy of food and eating. Meals are not allowed to be brought from outside. Main meals allowed to be eaten in the dining area while sitting at the table, expected to demonstrate socially acceptable manners like cutting food into normal size pieces, appropriately using uh, utensils, etc. Snacks are followed to be eat, allowed to be eaten in the dining room or in the yard area. Meals and snack eaten under the supervision of a counselor. Any changes have to be approved by the dietitian. Guests are not allowed to visit during meal times. The food is kosher based because it's a government uh, paid uh, uh, center. So the, how, the housing guidelines and rules. The referral process, referrals by eating disorder centers throughout Israel. A patient might first express motivation and commitment to the rules and has to be approved by the national social security as qualified for the basket of rehabilitation, what we call Sarshiku. The first stage at the house is the first two weeks. They are dedicated to determining the resident's compatibility with the house rule. The second stage is to create individual plan for habilitation, like in work, volunteering, study and nutrition. And the third stage is living by your own. The family policy, great emphasis and important to maintain a good relationship and connection with family is crucial in this house. The family is invited to the house for initial meeting with the social work and house director. The staff maintain contact with the family throughout the rehabilitation process. The payment. Each resident must pay monthly about $250 from their uh, budget that they get from the social security monthly. Unexpected expenses such as private doctors services or uh, some other stuff are the responsibility of the residents. Most other expenses are covered fully by the Ministry of Health and partially by the Ministry of Welfare, according to the Israeli law. Home equipment, each resident receives basic furnishing like bed, dresser, curtains, desk, linen, and more. But the resident bring their own personal supplies. Smoking and pets are not allowed in the house and the house is kosher based. The daily schedule. Resident must develop a personal schedule that include the house chores. Like they have to be part of cooking, cleaning pub, public, public spaces, and of course their own room, laundry, and more. Resident must attend the house meeting. Resident must submit with a weekly written plan to the staff that includes going away, work, school, appointment, and so on. In terms of work and other activities outside the house, each resident has to work, either work, study, or volunteer while staying at home. Until finding 
this kind of occupation, they expected to work more extensively at the house accompanied with the home mother. Meaning that they cannot wake up at 12. The wake up time is seven o'clock and they have to structure the day. This is part of their rehabilitation. Guest visiting, visiting time, guests are welcome to visit at most time, except during meals, house meeting, or individual resident housework plan. Weekends and holidays allowed, uh, the, the resident allowed to visit families during all weekends, except of one weekend, once a month, that they require to stay at the house for Shabbat dinner together. It's to be together and to get together. If there is a concern that going home may risk a relapse, the residents recommended to remain in the house during weekend, even if most of them are out. Violation of house rules, the residents who fail to meet the house rules may discharge from the house. There is a three stages. The first one is up to three warning. The second stage is meeting with the disciplinary committee. And the third one is leaving the house. So let's wrap up. Over the, the past 15 years, our house have been received, receiving an increasing number of referrals. The houses are generally full with a waiting list of about two months. And since the COVID, now they have to wait six months. The Ministry of Health has decided to open two more houses in addition to the first two that we established together. We are now in the process of establishing another rehabilitation house for more, more severe and enduring severe cases of anorexia nervosa. So now we have the two first one was in the center of Israel, in Tel Aviv, the one in the north part of Israel, Tzedala Derech that I, I presented now, the, the one that I established. And there is another one in Jerusalem and another one in the south part of Israel. And as I said, now is in the process. In terms of research, we had only a preliminary research result emphasizing the effectiveness of this program, uh, but it's a very preliminary one. And another follow-up study after 10 years is in a process uh, and hopefully I will be able to present it next year. So just a little bit of acknowledgement because as you can assume, many people were involved in this project. So Tanya Leaf, she was from the Israeli National Social Security. She approved our program and the head of the Rambam Medical Center, Professor Biar, that, that was sponsored this program, they helped us a lot, and the Hood Klein, the head of the psychiatric division, and Ethan Gur, which was, he is still the head of the eating disorder unit for adults in the center of Israel, and other very uh, helpful people, Miri Givon, Sarit Huma, Galia Bigler, Orna Kabakov, all the eating disorder staff member of the eating disorder center at Dramba Medical Center, and of course, the staff member of the rehabilitation house. All of them had contributed valuable to the establishment of the rehabilitation house. So if you have any question, I will be pleased to answer. And if you would like to read a paper that I wrote about this project, here is the reference. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ladzer. What what uh, what an amazing initiative! I am really in admiration, and I wish we could do the same here in our region. Unfortunately, there is not much interest in the subject, but this is a wonderful, wonderful subject. I mean, an initiative, and uh, really well done. Well done. It's really I'm in awe. It's it's so fantastic. 
Unfortunately, we are running out of time, so we won't be able to take questions. However, Professor Ladder will put her email in the chat, and then she can you can email her your questions directly. Okay, great. Thank you very much. The presentation was very short, but it took us about eight years to get the approval. Yes, yeah. to know. <laughs> it's not so easy. I'm, I'm, I am willing to wait eight years, but it will still not happen. <laughs> but but well done, well done. Well Thank done, you very really. Much, Karin. Uh, Dr. De La Grave is unable to activate his audio, it seems. Uh, can you just unmute yourself? No? Just unmute. Doesn't work. Okay, so maybe now, we... Now we, it works. Yes. Now yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Thank so now it is my great, great pleasure and honor to present my mentor and friend, Dr. Ricardo de la Grave, who is director of the Department of Eating and Weight Disorders at Villa Garda Hospital in Italy. In his department, he developed an original treatment for the eating disorder based entirely on the enhanced cognitive behavior therapy, CBTE. He adapted a CBT, outpatient CBTE for adolescents with eating disorders and a personalized cognitive behavior therapy for obesity, CBTOB. He is the author of 175 peer-reviewed articles, several book chapters and books, including the two recent books, Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Adolescents with Eating Disordered, and Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Eating Disorders in Young People, a Parent's Guide, which I highly recommend. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dr. De La Grave is going to present to us today the implications of the disease model and psychological model on eating disorder treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karim. <laughs> you promote the book. Uh, is... <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi to everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming to my presentation. First of all, let me thank uh, the European chapter of eating disorder, the Middle East chapter of eating disorder, and, and Latin American chapter of eating disorder. I want to, to thank in particular uh, Dr. Nizzoli for this invitation and also for his uh, fantastic work in conducting the European chapter of eating disorder. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Nizzoli. My, my presentation will be very brief and very conceptual. I, I try to, to discuss with you what are the clinical implications of a disease and the psychological model on the treatment of eating disorder. I start with this, uh, this sentence of Christian Median Serpel that affirmed that uh, the egocentric nature of some expression of eating disorder psychopathology are the main reason behind the, re the reluctance of the people with eating disorder to seek, engage, and persevere with the treatment. I remember you that uh, egocentric is a term that refers to the behaviors, values, and feelings that are in harmony with or acceptable with the needs and goals and the ego or consistent with one's ideal self-image. If we take uh, this definition, um, there are many features of eating disorder that satisfy this uh, uh, definition. Some cognitive features, sorry, oh, sorry. Some cognitive features, such as the over-evaluation of shea weight and eating and their control, the strict dieting and excessive exercises, and the low weight. The, the question why does a person continue to adopt a strict diet and other extreme weight control behavior to lose weight and change the shape of their body weight despite uh, the adverse effects on their physical health, psychological well-being in an in interpersonal relationship is a widely debated issue, but we need an answer. And uh, 
in this uh, editorial uh, that was just published on the eating weight disorder, I tried to describe uh, the two main models uh, that uh, tried in, in, in the past to explain the egocentric nature of some expression of the eating disorder. The first uh, is the, what we call the disease model, also called the medical model, and the second is the psychological model. According to the disease model, strict dieting, binge eating, the fear of weight gain, and the preoccupation with shape and weight are symptoms of specific disease or illness, like, uh, for example, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, other eating disorder. It is clear that the disease model has a very important implication for the treatment. It used mainly what I can I define as a prescriptive approach that in some case can become coercive because the goal is to defeat, defeat the disease. In this model, usually the patient adopt passive roles. The, this treatment, for example, ask the patient not to trust about their faults, about shape, weight, and eating, because they are the symptoms of their disease, the ill part of the brain. And the patient are, should follow the prescription of a doctor, psychology, and dietitian. It is clear that in this model, this, the clinician adopts an active role and, prescri and prescribe the solution. Also in this model, uh, for example, the parents or significant other sometimes are involved as, as controllers. They are often involved, for example, overseeing the patient to follow the therapeutic prescription, especially during the, fam during the meals. This model has important advantages. Uh, first of all, it uh, does not blame the patient uh, or the parents uh, for the development of eating disorder because uh, the eating disorder it is with uh, as uh, an external agent akin to other pathogen. And uh, also it favors the allocation of economic resources to research and treatment of eating disorder that we need, we need because usually in the, they are less funded by, by the national government. However, there are several flow, flows in this model. The first, and this is very important, we have, we have no biomarker of the eating disorder. Even if uh, we have more than 100 years of biological research uh, in eating disorder, the biological causes of eating disorder have not yet been identified. Um, as uh, my colleague uh, Yael described well, uh, we have short-term outcome in compliant patients during intensive medical treatment, uh, but frequent uh, relapse uh, at home uh, of uncontrolled pa patients. And, sec and third, I underline very often this problem. Uh, it robs the patient of the opportunity to understand the psychological function, but also I underline the individual experience associated with the control of shape, weight, and eating. And uh, we have also to pay attention because it is uh, true that uh, the disease model can address the stigma, but uh, paradoxically, it can favor also the stigma because eating disorder can be considered as an irritable and immutable per part of a person. On the contrary, the psychological model is based, are the, the, they are based on hypothetical constructs. Uh, and uh, if you read the literature of anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa and recent binge eating disorder, other eating disorder, like a nutritional disorder, as ARFID, there are several, several psychological theories that have been proposed both to explain the egocentric nature of eating disorder and also they try to explain the, the recent and persistent. Here, I briefly describe 
the psychological model adopted by adopted by the enhanced cognitive behavior therapy because is the psychological model that I know better and I work using this treatment. Uh, and uh, according to the, psych the CBT psychological model, the person has difficulty in seeing dieting and low weight as a problem because uh, the safe evaluation is predominantly based on the shape, weight, and eating control. We describe this uh, as a pie chart, and you see uh, where is a principal domain based on the control of weight and shape, and very few other domains on which the patient pose the evaluation, very different from the self-evaluation system of a patient without a person without eating disorder. If a patient uh, has an over-evaluation of shape and weight, uh, it is uh, understandable why the strict diet exercising low weight, but also the control of body weight and shape are not seen as a problem, but are often associated by well, with a sense of realization because they fit the self-evaluation system of the patient. So this, this model explains why the patient persists in controlling eating weight and maintaining low weight despite the negative consequences because the self-evaluation of the patient is based predominantly on the control of body weight shape and eating. This model has important uh, clinical implication because uh, CBT, for example, address the patient individual psychopathology. So the psychopathology that operate in the, in the person with a flexible and personalized approach and do not address the DSM-5 diagnosis. In addition, the model adopts a collaborative approach. It never uses prescriptive or coercive procedures and never ask patients to do anything that they are not willing to do. For example, the first part of the treatment does not include weight regain, but it aims to help to help the person understand the psychological nature of the eating disorder to reach a better condition to evaluate the implication of change. At the end of this phase, we call the step one of the treatment. If patients do not agree to make the change, we interview the treatment, but this uh, it doesn't occur so often. In the second active phase, we call the step two of the treatment, the patient learns to address the individual eating disorder psychopathology and uh, to tackle weight regain, if indicated, using a very flexible set of sequential cognitive and behavioral strategy and process progressive education. The implications of the treatment are different from the disease model because uh, the goal here is to develop other more functional domain of self-evaluation. And uh, also the role of the patient, of the therapist, and the parents is very different because the, the role of the per, per patient is very active in deciding to change and to address the change and working collaborative with the patient. We call it collaborative empiricism. And the clinician are helper of the patient in helping the, to understand the psychological characteristics of the eating disorder, and also in helping the patient to address the maintenance processes of the eating disorder with specific and individualized strategies and procedures. According to this model, also the parents have a different and significant others as it have a different roles because they are helpers in creating an optimal family environment and in supporting the child to implement some procedures of the treatment. The psychological model has, has several advantages. It increases the patient understanding and facilitates the empowerment and the development of a collaborative therapeutic relationship between patient and clinician. It improves also the patient knowledge of a psychological function of a eating disorder in a stress-free context. And even when the patient interrupts the treatment, leave the patient the door open to address actively the treatment with a psychological approach. 
Finally, the historical analysis of the life events carry out in the later phase of CBT as the patient to normalize their experience, so without adopting a medical model. And finally, the efficacy of CBT is supported by several clinical studies. However, as like the medical model, has some flaws. It is clearly dependent on the active engagement of the patient in overcoming their eating disorder that uh, we know it is not always possible to obtain. And also it, it may prove ineffective in patients who are actively engaged and this uh, may increase their sense of helplessness toward the eating disorder and delay the implementation of other treatment. However, we try to prevent this uh, interrupting the treatment in a couple of months if a patient is not active and is not responding, and we recommend other form of treatment. And there is a risk, clearly, uh, of a patient clinical deterioration during this time, but we have to prevent this. Here is the table that I prepare with for, for you to, to distinguish the, the two models. Uh, there are differences uh, on the conceptualization of eating disorder, according to the disease model, the illness is separated from the patient. We call this externalization. For example, this is used by family-based treatment. In the psychological CBT model, we never separate the illness from the patient. The involvement of the patient in the disease model is not actively involved. On the contrary, the psychological model is actively involved. And also is different the involvement of the parents, uh, that they are controllers, on the contrary, in the psychological model are helpers, uh, and the treatment team that use an active and prescriptive approach, on the contrary, on the psychological CBT, they use a collaborative approach. But also the vocabulary that we use uh, with the patient is very different. Here, I take some example. For example, in the disease model, there is a separation of the illness from the patient. For example, they can see the model, the therapist they can say, this is, uh, that is not your speaking, that is your disease, or you are dieting and exercising excessively because you have an eating disorder. On the contrary, in the psychological CBT model, we never uh, separate the illness from the patient. And we, for example, we can say strict, strict dieting and low weight are the expression of the over-evaluation of shape and weight. It is true that many clinicians and researchers adopt a biopsychosocial rather than purely biological conceptualization of eating disorder. However, this rather nebulous approach, in my opinion, encourages undisciplined eclectism and therapeutic drift, especially in multidisciplinary clinical service for eating disorder, without a, a unifying theory. So my recommendation, for, for example, for a, a research perspective, a, clini a clinical research perspective, without a, a unifying theory, it is also almost impossible uh, to understand which, which parts of the treatment do and do not work, create, creating an, a barrier to any meaningful evolution in the treatment approach. And this is a, a problem that we have to address in the field of eating disorder. We know that it's very difficult to understand the mechanism of action of our treatment. Also, the evidence-based treatment like CBT, FBT, are really, uh, we, are, we, di we really di do not know uh, what are the mediator of the treatment. And we are working to to, to study this in future randomized control trial. I, I, I take the occasion to, to, to inform you that next year we'll start a very, a very important randomized control trial in Norway comparing, that will compare the FBT and CBT for a young patient with anorexia nervosa. And one of the goals will be to study the mediator, the mechanism of action of the two treatment, but also the moderator to understand which, uh, for which type of treatment, uh, for which patient this treatment works. 
it is clear that if we use a very, very eclectic approach, it is also more and more difficult to understand the mechanism of action of our treatment. And we, if we do not know the mechanism of action, it is difficult to make an improvement of our treatment. I conclude with a, a final recommendation. Given the lack of uh, demonstrated efficacy of uh, treatment based on biological intervention, clinician and clinical service, I, in my opinion, should design their care pathway around a unified theoretical model coherent with the evidence-based psychological intervention available to date. Even when there is, there is a clinical need to implement specific medical intervention in association with psychological treatment, in my opinion, it is advisable to maintain a shared language and uniform multidisciplinary approach based on the theory and the psychological treatment on which the patient is treated. This will help prevent confusion and discontinuity of care among patients, empowering them to take control of their thoughts and behavior and hopefully drive their own recovery. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, as Hello, always. Uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> no, no, fantastic. The only Actually, one. We, have, <laughs> the only we one. have more time. <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> So uh, actually we have, unfortunately, our next speakers have had to cancel because both of them have an emergency to tend to. So I you could have- asked for the time uh, restriction. So, uh, so I have two suggestions. Dr. Dada Grave would like to speak more uh, and or we can open the floor for questions. We have time, uh, even you know, open discussions, comments, uh, raise hands. Um, so yes, let's take uh, you know those ten minutes, even fifteen minutes, to uh, to have a nice discussion between all of us. I'm going to start with a question to uh, Pro uh, Professor Ladzer regarding fasting in uh, Judaism. So I know that you have Yom Kippur, and then there's those forty days also at, of of fasting. I'm not an expert, but but I do know that. Uh, this you have this in in Judaism. So in those houses, do they fast during this time? So if they are there during Yom Kippur or during the fasting um, time required, do do they fast or not? Do they continue the you know their uh, their assigned um, meal plan and meals? So I liked so much the presentation about the Ramadan. Uh, that and I, f I felt like you know we are talking about the same the same phenomenon, but uh, with another culture. Uh, according to our uh, regulation and uh, and rules, uh, those who suffer from anorexia nervosa, they 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 are not allowed to fast. Okay. Not at all. There is no any you know exception and we we are talking about even you know not fasting at all all their life because mm -hmm. we know that fasting is a trigger and all dieting behavior is a trigger for the for the it is disorder mindset the illness voice immediately because they are predisposed to this illness in terms of uh, those who suffer from bulimia, we are more flexible, but also not in their, you know, acute illness, only after a remission of at least few years. Because, few years. They, because they tend also to, you know, when they skip meals or they start restrict, restricting meals, then immediately they get into the cycle of mm. purging and uh, and uh, binging. So, so we we had a big debate about it, a big debate, and this is a policy so far. Okay, that's a fantastic policy. 
uh, and we need to uh, to basically adopt it here as well. So so during this time in the houses they are not fasting, correct? No. They are eating that's their meals. That's the recommendation. Normally. Okay. That's the okay. recommendation. You know, you you can never know what they are doing at home, but that's no, no, but in, in the house, in yes. the houses. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No fasting. Okay. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Uh, please feel free to send your questions in the in the chat box, or uh, you can raise your hand, and we can give you. Uh, I see Eva raise her hand. Please, Eva. <laughs> Thank you, Karin. I just want to add to what Gail said. Um, here in Mexico, I work with a lot of uh, patients uh, from with Jewish patients, and I I speak very often with the rabbi, and he told me that no reason to accept, accept fasting for these patients. So we always say first is life and we have to save it. So um, we don't allow them to fast either. Okay, thank you, Eva. Uh, I, I would like to encourage the colleagues from you know, the different regions maybe to, uh, uh, you know, to share experiences. Maybe they have comments. Uh, maybe challenges um, in their parts of the world. It's also an open uh, an, an open forum. If you have questions, of course, Carol has questions. <laughs> Please, Carol, go ahead. Of course, <laughs> amazing project, Dr. Gayal. I'm I'm really impressed as uh, Karin expressed. Uh, but like I know we're far from getting there, but I'm still interested to know some, since we have time to know little bit more details like I I felt I don't know maybe it's misconception but I felt that the rules were too strict will it be the case for the whole 18 months or will it change like no smoking no visitors during meals uh, you, you, you have to unmute yourself I can't hear you thank you very much Carol it's a very very good question and of course, we have level of responsibilities, you know, when they go to at the beginning, it's very, very strict. But for example, supervising meals, we expect them to go forward and to eat by themselves and to go out and to eat out. Yeah. So of course, they are not super supervised the whole, you know, period, but that's the structure. And at the beginning, they are fighting against it. And they're yeah. manipulating us, you know, you know the manipulation. And mm -hmm. if somebody is trying to do the manipulation, the voices they are so jealous that they are talking after the patient, after the other residents, because they feel like, how come she's not eating what she expected and I have to eat everything. And the rule of a BMI 19, which I, I agree with the comment about a BMI, I really like the comment, but we have no other option but to put a strict, you know, boundaries in terms of BMI, because this is the the, the limit, you know. To, like, and criteria for selection, you have to choose yes, something to, yes, to yes. put there that is a little bit more normative, even if not always, uh, you know, representative. Yes, you're Thank right. You. Yes, very good question. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. We have a question for uh, Ricardo. He's going to love it. What's the, the, the difference between the role of parents in FBT and CBTE? But uh, you can answer for me because we wrote a book together, you know, very well. <laughs> we discuss a lot. However, it is clear that uh, no. the, the role if, is very... If, if we have some minutes... Yeah. Yes, just, we have. Uh, just a, a brief uh, answer. Uh, it is clear that the two models are, they have a com completely concept different conceptualization of the eating disorder. As I, I describe, uh, the FBT is based on the, the use of externalization. So the idea is that the young person has no control of the eating. She, the young person is in a too egosyntonic phase of eating disorder and needs an external control. So, and you see this, especially in the first phase of FBT, where with the family meals, where the parents are actively engaged, while on the contrary, 
uh, during fa the family meal. On the contrary, the young, pa the young patient is passive. On the contrary, the CBT uh, conceptualization is very different. We, 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 we underline that uh, it is true that uh, the low weight dieting has a positive function for the patient, but the patient can help uh, to be to, to learn that is dysfunctional and to play an active role during the treatment. And uh, if a patient is engaged in trying to change, we involve the parents to help the, the, the child to address some difficulties, for example, during the meals or applying other procedures of the treatment. So in, while in FBT, we can say the parents are controllers and they are very active because FBT engage actively the parents. On the contrary, in CBT, we engage actively the young patient and the parents are, 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 are helper. Having two different conceptualization of the eating disorder and, uh, and, and also different roles of the parents and uh, the, the patient uh, is very useful for reserve, not just because we have two different approaches for the young patient, CBT, in a non-randomized control trial show to be to have a similar effect of FBT at six and 12 months follow-up. But it is important also to understand the mechanism of action of the treatment because they are based on two different conceptualization. They, they have two mechanisms, they, they use different procedures. So we hope uh, in the trial that I will supervise with Daniel Lagrange last, uh, la next year in Norway to understand both of the moderators of the treatment, for which treatment is better uh, FBT, for which patient and family is, uh, is better FBT or CBT, but also the ambition goals is to finally to understand the mechanism of action of the two treatment. We think that there are some uh, uh, procedures uh, that uh, are uh, similar in the two treatments, for example, the wagging, the, uh, the weekly wagging, but also the habitual to the food uh, that we use uh, in both treatments. But there are many other different uh, procedures, and ho I hope uh, that uh, we will find more data on the moderators and on the mediators of the treatment. It is important to understand that this is a great opportunity. It is a great opportunity both for the research, but also because we have now two evidence-based treatment for the young patient. So if a, if a patient is not responding to FBT, there is an alternative psychological treatment like CBT for young patient that can be recommended to the patient. And I am supervising various group in Australia, in England, in Norway, that they share with him the experience of the transition from patients that are failing FBT and they start the CBT, changing completely the role of the parents and of a, of a patient during this transition. And this can work. You know, Karin, you have a, a lot of experience also on this topic and also in the, in the transition. The so, transition, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, doctor. Uh, I guess, uh, do we have time for more questions or Dr. Nizoli is going to take the floor and we're going to move to yeah, the so. next chapter? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's a there's a question. More, one more question. Shall we take it, Doctor Nizoli, or you want to start? Yeah, no, no, I, I have to. I have to use this opportunity to share okay. together to share together some comments about uh, Ricardo D'Alegra, my friend. Uh, <laughs> I no, I approve completely his approach. He find that this approach is the clever, uh, the most excellent experience. But me, I'm the leader of the global system. And inside the global system, there are a large group of people and there are very different approaches in different teams. And so we need everywhere to consider that the, the unique language is the base for every professionals working in the different teams. But because we have 
more than 100 theoretical expression explanation of the eating disorder we have inside the for example the services that treat eating disorder in italy more than 100,000 professionals and they are they came from different specific theoretical view and so we need we need to organize training for everybody to build the best team that we can. And so my view is to start from the basic, the bottom, from the bottom to the upper, to the upper side, because otherwise we are uh, in face of the best explanation of the model. Ricardo, absolutely for me, is the excellence. But the majority, the large majority of the services don't follow this, this method. Yeah, my, my suggestion, Umberto, and I discuss a lot of this topic when we, we wrote uh, the Italian, for, for, you know, the, we have the quadern of, of health system where, where we, we recommend the approach uh, for the Italian um, clinician. I discuss a lot with the colleagues and also with Professor Mario Mai, that is uh, the leader of the world psychiatry. And uh, I agree with what you say, but it is important to underline that uh, we have to work on the theory, okay? So mm -hmm. our work uh, mm -hmm. should be dictated by the theory. This is the only way to invalidate our theory and to step on, to go, to improve our theory. My, my worry is if without uh, uh, working on, uh, on a theory, and I don't, uh, I have a theory, CBT theory, but there are many other theories like you uh, well uh, underline. It is difficult to um, develop improvement and we need improvement of the treatment of our patient. And after it, there is the risk also to deliver contradictory approach to the treatment. So uh, one of the most difficult uh, part of our work uh, is the multidisciplinary work. Is it, exactly. it's, not, uh, it's, not, it's not enough to say we work together, but exactly. we have to, to exactly. discuss the language, the terminology, Absolutely. the goals Absolutely. of the treatment, the strategy, you know, the roles of the of 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 participants. Uh, and uh, so exactly. it is an, an important topic of discussion, but also to implement in the clinical service this. We, we have to work uh, to, to improve uh, the implementation of a multidisciplinary approach of our of our eating disorder. Exactly. Thank we you. Improve. We need to improve the, the common language. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. I agree completely. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. It was a wonderful session. Uh, and now I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Nizoli to share, uh, to chair the HLA um, chapter session.